yeah, my job is to, to tell you why we still need a surgeon. I put a question mark, but uh, probably that's wrong. But nevertheless, I should elaborate why we still need a surgeon. And inf I found it very easy. And I need just one slide for this. We need a surgeon because the appropriate surgical treatment, appropriate surgical treatment, provides the most physiological palliation of coarctation. And that's the point. So I'm not going to talk about why we still need a surgeon. I am going to talk <coughs> about appropriate palliation of coarctation. There's a bunch of paper who show on the evidence-based level B, coming from the cardiology literature, that, and we know that, that even simple coarctation, simple one, is a complex disease with important long-term morbidity and mortality. Nothing new. Unfortunately, survival benefit after surgical treatment of coarctation is much worse, much worse, as you can see after 30 years, as expected survivors, despite the fact that we have very well-defined treatment goals. The first treatment goal, and by the way, it's very easy to achieve, is just to relieve arch obstruction, and Ingo was talking about this. And you can use whatever, it's easy. However, and that's the point, to provide normotensive, lifelong normotensive circulation is a very difficult task. Is it important? Yes, it's very important. Because the most important risk factor of late morbidity and mortality is, in fact, arterial hypertension. Everybody knows that. So I think that we should rephrase everything, what was said up till now, and we should ask, what is the appropriate palliation? Because it's not treatment, we know, it's palliation. It's not correction, it's palliation. What is the appropriate palliation of coarctation regarding, first of all, timing of treatment, treatment modalities, and effectiveness of treatment? And I'd like to get through these uh, issues uh, very shortly. So first, let's start with the timing of treatment. What do we know about this? Again, a bunch of paper, you know that, who show on the evidence based level B that older age at repair, whatever we do, simply older age at repair is a major predictor of late complication. Is it so bad? It's very bad, actually. If treatment, whatever kind treatment, is done during the first year of life or first years of life, as you see here, the risk of late hypertension, because this graph just represents the risk of late hypertension regarding to the age at repair, the risk of late hypertension in a lower age is pretty low. However, if treatment is postponed beyond, let's say in this case it's about seven years or whatever, the risk of late hypertension is enormous. Another point. This is the graph representing the risk of hypertensive response to exercise. And it's even steeper than the previous one, but the, the principle, of course, is still the same. If treatment is provided pretty early in the life, well, the risk of uh, hypertensive response to exercise is relatively low. However, it's extremely high when the treatment is postponed for whatever reason. So it's, I think there is an agreement that the optimal timing of coarctation treatment, I'm not talking about the surgery, as you see. <laughs> optimal timing of coarctation treatment is as soon as possible during infancy. I'm very sorry that speaks for surgery. Yeah. But because I know that predominantly, you know, there are cardiologists, and yesterday I realized that I have to much be much more precise in my definitions. I prepared the special definitions for cardiologists. To delay coarctation repair until the patient is old enough to safely undergo balloon dilatation and stenting is clearly inappropriate. That's it is. Let's talk about the modalities of treatment. In my mind, because ballooning is out of the game, we have two modalities, surgery and stenting. Um, it's like a beauty and beast. And you can pick up what is a beauty and what is a beast for you. For me, this is a beauty. <laughs> because this is, despite the fact that Ingo showed you a, a long list of all different surgical treatments, 
starting in the last century, of course. This is the current treatment strategy. That's how the coarctation in these days is, is fixed. It means sick tissue is resected, as you see on the upper panel, and then nice end-to-end, -end, appropriate, technically well done, end-to-end -end or extended end-to-end -end anastomosis is performed, or, as you see on the lower panel, if the arch is hyperplastic, because that's the weak part of our indication process, to have a coarctation and smallish arch. We, it's a problem to define what is smallish arch, but nevertheless, if there is a smallish arch, end to side anastomosis is performed, or arch is repaired, and I, I guess that uh, Christian will show you how the arch is repaired. So that's the beauty. I show you how the coarctation is done. This is a short surgical video. It's an operation in newborn. You see we are in the chest. This moving part is, is not a heart, but it's a lungs. The coarctation or whole aorta, descending part of the aorta, aortic arch, usually uh, distal transverse arch, subclavian artery, and surrounding structures are dissected free and mobilized. I think it's fair to say that in these days, the chest is open with really short incision. It's a muscle, so-called a muscle sparing incision which protect to keep the spine in the proper position and so on. So that's how it looks like in newborn. PDA is always bigger than the distal arch. This is a distal arch. And you see the subclavian artery. The surgery is simple. The segment above and below coarctation is clamped. Then, as I said, whole thick tissue, ductal tissue, is removed. And now uh, one can appreciate how the ductal tissue looks like from inside. And you will see it is simply, it's a thick, ugly looking tissue. You know, this, this wall is, is, uh, is completely different than the healthy tissue. So simply, this tissue is eliminated. Then the distal transverse arch, it means the segment between the left uh, carotid and the left uh, subclavian artery is open. And this is the, uh, the type of extended end-to-end -end anastomosis. Please uh, notice that the whole anastomosis, it's, it's an uh, intima to intima contact and it's very narrow suture line. And under normal circumstances, extremely narrow scar formation develops during the healing process. So this is the upper part of the anastomosis. The whole operation, I mean this clamping uh, situation takes sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 15, it depends. But it's a, it's a Nice surgery, more or less relaxing type. And that's how it looks like from inside. In newborn, what is important, I think what is important for you to uh, re recognize is that always the pleura is closed. So the aorta where you want to put a balloon stand or whatever, <coughs> it's somehow protected, everything is packed together. I think this is important. Stenting. I think you, you saw millions of stents, of course, but unfortunately just from outside, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I, because I like cardiologists, I show you how the stent looks like from inside. This is, of course, not a good example. It's not a coarctation. It's a difficult arch in difficult patient. And our guys did an excellent job in stenting. They are really outstanding. I, I'm sometimes amazed how, how they do it and how effectively they do it. This is a patient with, uh, with tetralogy, in fact, and you see ugly-looking right-sided arch. They put uh, millions of stents there, I think four or something or three, and you see the, ice, uh, the arch is, is, is beautiful after standing. And then when patient came for, for correction, tetralogy was done first, then we did this uh, reconstruction of, of uh, Iota. First, my, my plan was, because the uh, stenting segment was very low, uh, long, I saw that I will just open this stent, this beast, because you will see how it looks like. And I just put a, something about to enlarge the whole area. So now we are in the uh, part of the operation where I'm trying to cut through the stent. You see, it's, uh, we have a very uh, uh, crafty uh, uh, chair. So anyway. 
it's uh, resected because I realized that it's impossible to put uh, something about. So the whole segment which was stented was removed. What is interesting on that is that, and we see that very frequently in stenting patient, then the wall above, you see the wall of the aorta is very thickened. Wall above and below standing is different. Then another interesting point, uh, surgeons who are sitting here can see that immediately, that the dissection of whole descending aorta is problematic because everything is in an inflammatory tissue. The stenting triggers enormous inflammatory reaction around. So it's not easy to dissect and to get out of this uh, beast. So it's out, and now you can appreciate how the stent looks like from inside. So, let's see. So it's open, and now Felix can ask about the cross-talking of tissue. Everything is destroyed. Everything. The wall is extremely thickened. Even manipulation with this segment is difficult because it's stiff, rigid. So that's how the stent looks like. This is after correction of the uh, tetralogy. And here in this area, there is this uh, correctation segment, which is um, uh, reconstructed. <coughs> so effectiveness of the treatment. Ingo was right, completely right. And I use exactly the same uh, literature. Both methods, I mean surgery, stenting, are equally effective regarding release of gradient. Is it good enough for you? Well, we should redefine effectiveness in my mind. In my mind, effectiveness is long-term elimination of stenosis in any arch morphology. However, and this is an important point, while preserving the compliance of the aorta. And I will get to the compliance shortly. There is a bunch of paper, again, showing on the evidence-based level B. This is a, these are the surgical papers. That if end-to-end -end anastomosis, as I show you, or end-to-side anastomosis, is properly done in proper age and so on and so forth, recurrent obstruction is really very low. Is really very low. And if so, uh, usually occurs in this situation where we have a smallish transverse arch, or if it's a surgery of, uh, done on the neonate, or if the uh, arch has a suboptimal shape. And really, this uh, definition of smallish arch, I think it's extremely important for us to improve our results, because that's my feeling that very frequently we fix the coarctation, arch is simply smallish, and we believe that we'll, we'll grow. But in many cases, it's not a case, unfortunately. So I think that we, if we want to improve our surgical results, we should have a lower threshold for arch repair, complete arch repair. Even if the coarctation is clear, but if the arch is smallish, definition is probably uh, more than minus 2z. It means 3z and so on. Uh, we should be more aggressive. But this is my feeling. I don't have a data for this. So let's talk about the compliance of aorta. It's very well known that even in neonates, in this pre-coarctation area, there is an increased stiffness of aorta. However, not properly uh, executed treatment plan increased the stiffness of aorta enormously. This is excellent paper from a Munich group. They analyzed more than 400 patients, follow up 27 years. And as you can read the, the title, it's about arterial hypertension in a coarctation repair, after coarctation repair. So they analyze everything because it's really excellent paper. And, but I pick up this one. Analysis of the risk factors for hypertension after surgical coarctation repair without risk stenosis. So everything looks fine. So what are the risk factors in this subgroup? The most significant prosthetic material. In other words, and these are the conclusions of this paper, the use of prosthetic material either at surgical intervention, it means tube graft or dacron patch or whatever, or at catheter intervention, it means stent, significantly increase stiffness of aorta and the risk for arterial hypertension. 
the Munich group went even further and they realized that only few of the patients become normal tensive after effective stent implantation. And if you look on this picture, it's, it's clear. You know, this is stenting area, which is completely rigid as this Dacron tube, which we were replacing, I don't know, 20 years ago to these patients. So yesterday I guaranteed 20 years, you know, freedom from aortic valve replacement in certain uh, diseases. Here I can guarantee a lifelong stiffness of this segment. <laughs> because the non-compliant prosthetic material might cause increased pulse valve velocity, thus increasing systolic blood pressure and enhancing the effect of the inborn and acquired aortic stiffness seen in patients with coarctation. This is very important to somehow put together. So why not stent? Because stent is really a rigid tube and all the consequences. I don't want to get through this. I think everybody knows that. So I beg you, resist to perform intervention only because it's technically possible. Why? I don't understand this. I show you one example uh, how the treatment plan should not be done in this specific disease. And because it's a bad example, I pick up a patient from different department. Yeah. So this patient came to us from different department, but in this different department, I will stop it, was treated after birth for uh, aortic stenosis and this, this coarctation. By the way, surgically it will be done without any difficulties coarctation and aortic stenosis, very effectively. Anyway, 12 months later, after successful ballooning, came up with this uh, interruption, whatever, of the descending aorta, many collaterals with the failed left ventricle. So the baby stent was placed just to decompress the left ventricle for the temporary time. And one week later, the surgery was done. So this is the segment of aorta. You see the PDA and I'm just pushing where is the stent. Again, the same story. The stent is there only one week and this perivascular inflammation is enormous. So this is the area of the stent, was dissected and so on. And now uh, we are trying to eliminate this uh, stenotic segment and to remove the stent. If stent is there, let's say for one week, or so it's possible to remove that. If it is longer, it's impossible. So look on this alien. <laughs> so now it's coming out, delivered. It's a baby stand. So uh, <laughs> I like this. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we have to resect this segment, which was, of course, Stented. So the segment is uh, removed. And you can see that the aorta doesn't look nice. But when I open that, you will see uh, that the stent, of course, destroyed everything around. It's ugly looking tissue from inside. But what is even, but this is uh, what one would expect, of course. But what is dangerous, for example, and I realized that just by accident, there was a dissection. We were, we were happy. I am removing this dissection now. We were happy that it stopped, but you never know. Then, uh, after resecting the segment, we did a partial end to an anastomosis. And I pick up this part of the video because, again, to demonstrate that it's really like an intima to intima nice anastomosis, is a native tissue to native tissue. Uh, of course, there must be a small scar formation, but the rest of a reconstruction should have a normal compliance, should be a normal tissue. In this case, we had to enlarge the arch and to reconstruct the arch with the, with the patch, but please notice a normal thickness of the arch wall, aortic arch wall, because the aortic arch uh, or wall of the aortic arch doesn't, is not so thick as you see right now. It's just because, you know, 
there was a 12 months of severe hypertension in this patient because the treatment plan was simply not good. So we reconstructed that and it looks like uh, here and you see in this area, the area of the anastomosis and the pericardial patch which goes across. Our results, uh, I realized that we never somehow analyze our coarctation repair and for the sake of this presentation, we take a look. These are the data since 2005 to 2012. Uh, at that time we did uh, 200, more than 230 coarctation, but for, the, for this presentation I will talk only about the simple ones. We had nearly 100 simple ones. And when I first time saw this data, I was pretty disappointed, by the way. Anyway, so what is the problem? Uh, when we divided this group, when we divided this group to three age categories, we realized that from all these nearly 100 patients, 60% of patients were treated as it should be during the infant period, less than one year of age. However, there was a significant proportion of patients still in the category between 1 to 10 years, 25%, and about 10 years we had 15%. I expected completely different numbers that much more patients will be treated in the lower age group. Not the case, unfortunately. When we look on the treatment categories, how we handle that, you see that at the, at the age less than one year, uh, predominantly surgery. It's clear. However, a uh, certain amount of stenting, but all these stents were placed only to decompress the left ventricle, nothing else. So, in fact, were removed. So, all these patients had a surgery. However, in the category 1 to 10 years, it's a, like a 50-50 situation. I was surprised. I expected that surgery still will prevail because of the reason which I told you. About 10 years, no surgery. Obviously, we don't have a good uh, grab over our protocol as a surgeon, and uh, we have to work on that. Well, results, as one would expect, in, in these days, you know, th it's very unusual to have a, some kind of this type of complication. It can happen, of course, but in general, it's very safe. Both methods are extremely safe. When we look on the uh, effectiveness of the treatment, Again, we just confirm what was uh, shown by the different slides that pressure gradient, this is the pressure gradient at discharge. Uh, this is, this uh, green one is surgery and this pink is uh, stenting. So pressure gradient discharge or pressure gradient at follow-up equally effectively is decreased. However, in follow-up at the expense of certain reinterventions, it's obvious. And there is a significant difference between the reintervention re after surgery versus stenting. This is the amount of reinterventions in the surgical side and in the stenting side. So if it's much more reintervention for the stenting. So if you look on the freedom from reintervention, uh, so freedom for surgery is about 90%. We had three balloons because of scar formation. And freedom from reintervention for the stenting is uh, about 50%. Significant difference. So never, nevertheless, these are the other data. In my mind, the method of choice is early <coughs> surgical appropriate. Surgical repair with low threshold for arch repair. I think this is the room where we can even improve. Of course, there are other treatment modalities. Temporary stenting in newborns. However, only to decompress left heart. Extremely effective and perfect method. Ballooning only for recoarctation due to scar formation. Stenting only in all the patients if surgery is risky or end-to-end -end anastomosis is technically impossible. In that case, it's really, if, you, if surgeon puts a, a dacron patch or tube or you put a stent, it's the same. So the stenting at this, this point is is better. So, conclusions. Early surgery provides the most effective and physiological reconstruction of the arch, thus minimizing the risk of arterial hypertension in the long run. The favorable long-term surgical results clearly outweigh the proposed short-term benefit of stenting, <coughs> such as short hospital stay, no scar, less pain, and, and so on. Decreased compliance of aorta, whether 
after placing of tube or stenting is independent risk factor for all negative sequelae associated with arterial hypertension. To delay treatment until the patient is old enough to safely undergo stenting is clearly inappropriate and not justified. We should think about the quality of life of these patients. <laughs> so I like to thank everybody from my institution, even cardiologists I included, and thank you. <laughs>